Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. Corey and Chad here chatting with Sean Broderick, editor of Wealth Mega Trends and contributing analyst to Weiss Ratings Daily. Sean, we're going to focus a lot more on the energy sector in this interview and some good, some bad when it comes to different energy sectors. We're going to start with the good and that continues to be uranium. Now, the spot price right around $100 a pound. You could maybe argue that it's peaked or it at least came off of its recent spike high, but still $100. Who knows if it could even explode higher than that because uranium still is relatively a small market and a fairly tight market. We've seen majors continue to do pretty well. We've also seen a lot of news out of companies as well. So Sean, broadly, uranium What have you seen within your portfolio, and are you still excited about uranium plays? I'm still excited about uranium. We took a bunch of profits back in November, but we're in strong again, uh, and all the positions we have are up. And basically, that's because uh, we were lucky enough to purchase a bunch of companies which recently announced they're going to begin production again, or else maybe begin production for the first time. And so that's helpful. Now, I think part of what is weighing on the spot price of uranium is these announcements from all these companies, Energy Fuels, UEC, Denison, Encore, saying that they're going to start production, you know, and I think that can slow down the rise of uranium. But with all the new plants coming on and all that stuff and the lifespan of existing nuclear power plants being extended, I still think it's a supply-demand squeeze. The only thing that can really derail it is if we have a big nuclear accident again, you know, like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, something like that, which could happen. You know, I mean, uh, one of the world's biggest nuclear power plants is in the war zone of Ukraine. We have to remember that. But overall, I'm quite willing to ride this uranium bull and happy to do so. It's working out quite well for us. Well, Sean, just to follow up on that, when we were just at the conference season in Vancouver, a couple of events, uranium was the talk of the town. That Almost everybody pointed to that as the sector that outperformed in 2023. And we know we've seen that pattern before in other commodities, where if they were the flavor of the year in a prior year, sometimes they struggle in the following year. Are you concerned at all that maybe it's run too far too fast? Or are you encouraged that some of the stocks still aren't at levels that they were at in 2021 when uranium was only $50 to $60 a pound? How are you looking at the setup here? Exactly. I mean, many of those stocks are not at those levels. And if you adjusted the price of uranium for inflation, it's actually still quite cheap. And we know that once you get a uranium plant up and running, I mean, the cost of building the plant is a major part of like what nuclear power costs. Once you have it up and running... It's quite cheap to actually run them. And even if the price of uranium doubled from here, they'd still be quite cheap to run, you know? And it's just reliable. You can keep the lights on when everything else, you get less radioactivity from a nuclear power plant than you do from a coal plant because, of course, there's lots of radioactive material in coal and like stuff like that. So it just seems like the world is wising up to the fact that nuclear power is one of the things we have to keep in the mix going forward and probably expand using it. So I'm still quite bullish. I mean, we have really seen stockpiles come down and down and down. And that seems to be the difference this time. I mean, and like we don't have things like the Japanese selling their stockpiles into the market because after Fukushima, they said, well, that's it for nuclear power. So we can sell this uranium we have. That's not happening this time around. So um, it looks like There's a real difference between what's happening now and those times in the past when the price of uranium ran up and then peaked and then pulled back. I mean, maybe it's going to peak, but it's not going to be soon. We're having a slight pullback in the spot price of uranium, but that's really just catching its breath. Nothing goes in a straight line. So, uh, yeah, I'm still very bullish overall. What do you think about next gen within the uranium sector? It's a massive deposit. It's going to make money when it gets put into production. Problem being is that next gen market cap just seems too high for anyone to take it over. So how do you see the next gen card in the whole uranium sector playing out? Well, we already took gains on next gen a while ago, and 
you know, that was back in like November and then it just went sideways into December, popped again, pulled back again. Now it looks ready to pop again. I mean, it's okay. It isn't as close to production as some of the other companies I have. Just to compare to example, UEC. I mean, they're like, what is it, six to eight months away from production? We know they're going to go into production. And that's one you really want to own. And now both stock trajectories look the same. But as you said, next gen looks a little pricey for what you're going to get out of it right now. That said, I wouldn't blame anybody for owning it. Heck, maybe I'll buy it again. But I just think there are other stocks you can buy now that look like, well, to some point, they are better values. Well, just one more on the uranium sector here, Sean, and, and that's on the explorers. We've seen the advanced developers that are near production, like you mentioned, UEC or Encore Denison run. We've seen companies that are producers like Cameco run, but we really haven't seen the big epic move in a lot of the explorers yet. Is this a time to filter down the risk curve and start looking at some of the explorers, or are you more comfortable just sticking with the more established names? When I was a younger man, I would have said, yes, go ahead and filter down. Now that I'm old and the market has beaten me up plenty of times, I'm much happier sticking to ones that have a timeline to production. That's basically the way I'm doing it. Because, I mean, we don't know how long the bull market will last. I believe it's going to last for years. But it takes years to develop a new mine anyway, right? And so when you're buying an Explorer, you're hoping someone else is going to take it out. What if they don't take it out in that time frame of the bull market? And what if the money you put in there, you know, maybe some results aren't quite what they were hoping for. So your money becomes dead. On the other hand, look at a, a developer that has a timeline to production. There's going to be a lot more optimism. Every piece of news that comes out, everyone's happy and stuff like that. That's just going to support them. Now, I will miss out on those knock it out of the ballpark moves that you can see in Explorers when things hit right. It's just I'm too old and tired to actually worry about that right now. Oh, fair enough, Sean. We've all been sucked into the little guys and we've all been hurt by them. But I think we've all had some winners off the little guys, too. So it all depends on your risk profile. And as you said, maybe even your age. Let's look at the oil price then, because oil uh, continuing to steadily rise. It is still very much trading within a range it's been within for over a year now, but it's closing in on that $80 a barrel level. Look, we've had bulls say that the supply out there just isn't going to even keep up to demand and we could see higher, generally higher oil prices. But there's also bears out there saying, look, there's a war going on in the Middle East. There's a lot of tension around the world and that hasn't caused a huge spike in the oil price. Where do you stand on that debate? Yeah, that's a very interesting conundrum, right? I mean, uh, the news that seems to be moving oil as you and I talk is that Saudi Arabia ordered their national oil company, Aramco, to maintain oil production capacity at 12 million barrels per day. They're actually producing around 9 million. They were going to raise it to 13, and like Saudi Arabia said, nah, you know what, maybe we don't need it. And I don't blame them one bit, because the more capacity they add, the more actually bearish it is. I know that sounds counterintuitive to some people, but the more supply there is on the market, then the cheaper oil becomes. But what they want is they want the supply to be tight enough that prices stay up, you know? And uh, this makes good sense to me. Now, I know the bears have been pointing out quite rightly, yes, that there's tensions heating up in the Middle East and it hasn't really moved the price of oil. But I would say keep your eye on Russia and not for good reasons, because now we've seen Ukrainian drones strike Russian oil facilities. If a lot more of that starts to happen, you're probably going to see a price spike in the price of oil. Because if they start taking out those export facilities, and I'm sure the Russians will try and protect them, but the thing with drones is they're so darn sneaky, right? So if that kind of thing happens, that could uh, really light a fire under the price of crude. And then I know what's confusing a lot of people is we've heard bad news from Europe, and China, economically speaking, I mean, they just aren't seeing the growth that they want. But here in the U.S., I mean, we are having a revitalization of American manufacturing. Part of that is due to cheap energy prices. I mean, our prices are so cheap for things like natural gas, 
companies are actually moving lock, stock, and barrel from Germany over here to open up new plants. That's part of it. It's also the incentives that they gave for like a building new factories, stuff like that. But I mean, uh, we are seeing reindustrialization here in America, which is quite bullish. So I'd expect to see oil use grow slowly, maybe not as fast as the bulls want, but I'd really be keeping my eye on supply because if like Saudi Arabia can keep a lid on it, not only their production, but of course other members of OPEC plus, then uh, that'll keep prices supported. And if something goes wrong in Russia, which is actually the thing that I'm watching to see what the Ukrainians do next, right? I mean, if like something happens there, then we could see a price spike. Well, Sean, that's some great points on the macro side of the energy space. When you dive down into the companies, though, I want to give you a hat tip, Sean. I must have asked you a dozen times, you know, nat gas and oil, which one do you like better? And you've said avoid the nat gas stocks, focus on the oily names. And you've been spot on, Sean, because nat gas is down near two bucks. It's been really a complete divergence from what we've seen in oil and the oil stocks in the oil stock arena. Which ones do you like the most? Is it the more advanced producers that pay the dividends? Is it the growth companies? Or are you willing to eventually speculate on a few nat gas stocks just because they're so beat up? How are you looking at the stocks? Well, that's a good question. I don't want to look at nat gas stocks now. I mean, um, we need to see production in the U.S. go down because right now we are producing so much natural gas. It's just flooded the market. That That's one of the reasons I have a problem with the White House's decision to call a halt on like building that new nat gas export terminal, you know, because that's so helpful in so many ways. For one thing, we have a surplus of like nat gas in the U.S. anyway. We need to export more of it. And also, all that we don't export to other countries to keep the lights on, they're going to actually burn more coal, which is terrible. So I hate that. But just to get back to the point of like what you asked, I I do think that nat gas is really going to scrape along until we see production pull back here in the U.S. And you have to remember, while there are wells that just produced natural gas, oftentimes it's a mix. And so there isn't as much control on how much natural gas companies can produce. If they want to get oil, they're going to get natural gas anyway. So they're just going to have excess natural gas there. As for what stocks I like? Well, for an example, I like Diamondback Energy. It's a great stock. It's doing well for us, held its value when a lot of other things pulled back. And I think that's what you can really look at. Everybody knows everything about the majors right now. They really do. So it's the next tier down. That's really where you should look. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And I've actually been um, writing some reports about this. Things like robotics, artificial intelligence, stuff like that. Many of these companies mention those things without even knowing how they'll use it. They just think it's a fancy buzzword and like stuff like that. Oil companies, on the other hand, are really putting AI to work, helping them find oil deposits faster and easier than they used to. They're using robotics to actually drill for those wells, and so they have to hire less people. They're using these things to like leverage new tech into actually making these companies much more profitable. So um, that's kind of an exciting space to be looking at. So I would look at those companies that are actually um, out in the fields producing, not the biggest names, but the next tier down. I think that's where you have some uh, real potential. All right. We'll leave it there, Sean. Thank you very much for your insights on the energy sector. We've been paying more attention to the energy sector. And well, at least people have, I think, quite a few gains in the uranium stocks. And man, oh man, we get a lot of comments about natural gas. It's exciting because it's so volatile, but it's definitely been disappointing on the downside. Sean, thanks as always for your time. Have a great rest of your week. Hey, thanks. You guys too.